Salute! Salute unit, Sasha! Sasha, go ahead and cut my music. Cut my mother. Cut it. Cut that music, Sasha. My lovely assistant. Round of applause. Okay, that's it. It's my show, damn it. <laughs> What's up, everybody? BC Amplify coming at you. AEW Dynamite went off the airwaves last night. Let me tell you, man. I'm going to go over that card from last night. I am going to discuss AEW Dynamite 11 14 22. The go home show to full gear. Um, if not a full review, I'm, at, I'm going to touch up on basically every segment. Um, anything of worthiness, anyway. Um, or lack thereof, because you're, you're probably going to be shocked by what I got to say about full gear and last night, because it's conflicting feelings of how I feel about last night's show and how I actually feel about full gear. You might be a little taken back. If you watch the channel faithfully, um, this may surprise you a little bit. My take on both shows and what AEW has done fantastically and what they have done pretty tragically. <laughs> But the big story here is actually what happened after Dynamite. And by the way, much love and respect to my Green Bay Packers, man. Much power and strength to them tonight. Lambo against the Tennessee Titans. Thursday night football. Go, Pack, go. Salute to Aaron Rodgers and the boys. But after Dynamite went off the air last night. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Connecticut, home of world wrestling entertainment, obviously. Stanford. But MJF hit the ring. Oh, he was in the last segment anyway with Mox. Mox took off. Kind of gave him a shoulder fucking... A shoulder shrug on his way out. And Mox... Mox walks away with that grin on his face and MJF is like, all right, motherfucker, I'll give you that one. And then we go off there. Now, MJF stayed in the ring. And when Dynamite went off the air, he grabs the mic and typical MJF fashion. Now, he, whether the camera is on, whether this red light is on or the cameras are off and it's just for the house. This dude is going to give you a million and ten percent every single time. To say he's straight fire on the mic these days is an understatement. He's basically imploding the fucking mic. The mic is disintegrating at this point. That's how great MJF is. And we're not just blowing smoke up the dude's fucking ass so his head gets so fucking filled to an egotistical point that is so amplified that... Nobody can get through to this kid. We're not trying to do that. We're just giving him his flowers. We're giving him that respect that he goes out there and takes every time he grabs that mic. Every time he is in that ring, he takes the fucking respect. He doesn't even wait for us to give it. He's going into fucking shops and he's taking his own flowers. We're not just fucking trying to make this dude's head bigger and bigger every time he goes out there by, by giving him so much fucking praise. No, this dude is just earning it. BC doesn't give this much praise to many people. Sasha Banks, Bray Wyatt. Is there anybody else I give this much respect and flowers to? I don't know, bro. MJF goes out there and he earns it every, every single time. So, so on this instance, he ends the show really good. Mike work with Mox, by the way, to end the show. We'll get to that when I go over Dynamite. But afterwards is the big story here where everybody is going to be talking today about how he threw a jab over to CM Punk. And he did, no question. But there's a lot of passion and amplification into what MJF said in this house promo because this was just for the house. This was just for Bridgeport, Connecticut. But there was cameras rolling. Cell phones are out and they grab this shit and it already started to make the news cycle. But here's what I'm talking about for anybody that doesn't know living under a rock or it's just really early and, and you're just finding out about this. BC is your news source. This is what happened when Dynamite went off the air. MJF stays in the ring. Mox is already out. Show is over. MJF brings out Tony Khan. He invites Tony Khan into the ring. 
He says, Tony Khan's a little bit timid because they don't have the best of relationships, right? Storyline-wise and in real life, they've there have been reputable sources that have said there's been so much tension and MJF just thought he deserved the money that WWE wrestlers were getting when they came in. And Tony Khan was like, no, not until we restructure your contract. And then there was a big beef and MJF said, then I'm out. They had a nice talk. There was a restructuring of the contract. All seems to be, all seems to be better now. But Tony Khan's still timid when he's getting in the ring. So MJF says, don't worry. This is a quote. He looks at Tony Khan. He says, relax. I'm not going to shake you down for money yet. In other words, that's the bidding war of 2024. That's what I'm going to shake you down, motherfucker. So MJF proceeds at this point. Again, this I can't stress this enough. This is not for the cameras. This is not on television. This is just for Bridgeport, Connecticut. And MJF goes into a promo of a lifetime. And I've said this already in the past. Promo of a lifetime on a promo that he cut on screen. But this is just a fucking for the house. And he says, and I quote, this is MJF. This shit is not ballet. Every time we get into this ring, we are risking our lives. Do you people understand that? And we don't take that lightly. And what I damn sure don't take lightly is somebody coming into my company, dropping trout and taking a dump in my company. That shit ain't happening anymore. Exclamation point. He really drove home when he said, and what I damn sure don't take lightly is somebody coming into my company, dropping trout and taking a dump in my company. That shit ain't happening anymore. Because this is the place, and the only reason it's here is because of Tony fucking Khan. Literally, verbatim, I know BC drops F-bombs a lot. No, this is what he said to the crowd. Was there kids in the Yes, but this is MJF. If you're going to an MJF show, if you know MJF could be on the card, I don't know what to tell you. Don't bring your kid, put ear earmuffs, right? Old school fucking earmuffs, earmuffs, fucking uh, old school, the movie earmuffs <laughs> put in the fucking earbuds pop up some fucking Def Leppard on your kids fucking uh Walkman does anybody remember Walkmans all right what are they now iPods <laughs> those those are obsolete too what am I saying man just put on your fucking uh everything's on your cell phone these days man get put something on the screen and let your kid watch some cartoons man the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh who knows but if you're going to a show that has MJF on it, just know you're going to get full throttle amplified MJF. If you're going to an autograph session, he's going to flip you off. He's going to tell you what the fuck you're looking at. He's going to sign your shit and tell you to take a hike, hit the bricks. That's MJF. If you're going to cry about it, you don't know who you're going to get an autograph from. You don't know the show you're going to. Um, This was... And that was just half. There's another half to this promo. I'm going to get to that. But let's just break down this fucking half. This shit is not ballet. Every time we get into this ring, we are risking our lives. Do you people understand that? We don't take that lightly. And what I damn sure don't take lightly is somebody coming into my company, dropping trout, taking a dump in my company. That shit ain't happening anymore because this is the place. And the only reason it's here is because of Tony fucking Khan. Yes, obviously that's a, a, a fucking shot over to CM Punk. Because he is taking this with... Uh, now, whether we're being swerved or not for full gear, right? And he turns into that actual diabolical heel. The actual devil in pro wrestling. And we are all being swerved. Maybe William Regal's in on it. Who the fuck knows? But uh, a lot of people do feel, and there's a piece of me that feels like MJF is just best as the top fucking heel. The guy talking shit. The guy who doesn't give a fuck what you think. But... You learned last night in this promo that he gave the house that he can be that face and still not give a fuck what you think and probably get even more over. It's possible. But this dude, he, if you're going to put the company or remain it on your back, then you're, you're going to, you're absolutely going to go against what happened at All Out in that media scrum, that post scrum brawl. You're going to you're going to speak out against that. You're going to be team AEW. 
and you're going to go against the person that was trying to take a shit in your company, trying to take over. CM Punk said it best at the media scrum. He accidentally, I think it, he said this. He didn't want to say it like this, but it was truth. He said, I'm trying to run a business here. And you got people running around that couldn't even manage a, a fucking target. <laughs> These targets are getting big, by the way. Props to the managers at Target. Those, that shit's not easy to manage, I bet. Motherfucker, these people are managing 100 people uh, on any given day. So CM Punk disrespecting those nine to fivers. But you're going to... What's the word that I want, man? Um, you're going to adamantly reject that notion that you're coming in here getting all the money in the world, not moving the ratings one fucking iota. I told you guys many times, MJF is the one that was number one in the ratings. Even when CM Punk was there, it wasn't until Tony Khan started doing what BC told him to do for two months. Move CM Punk to the first segment, Q1, because that's where people are going to have the remote should I tune in or not? And that's going to be your best chance for CM Punk to move the needle. It didn't move that much, but at least he became the, the number one ratings draw for the most part. And then MJF was right there with him too. Sometimes even would take the top spot. But before that, MJF was taking the number one spot and he didn't even have WWE name recognition or value like CM Punk. And he was always right there, if not beating him. So, yeah, man, you're not just going to come in here, get all the fucking money, not move the needle, and then try to take over the company, run your own business, and we're just piss ants. No. And MJF has actually to spoken, from what I know, man, he's spoken pretty positively about CM Punk in the past. But it's time to put your big boy pants on and see that this is a fucking company that needs a total fucking amplification. It needs to be at an amplified status if you're truly going to rock into 2023 and beyond. Because pro wrestling as a whole has pretty much been on life support for 10 years. The ratings are dropping. The interest, the care has been dropping. And MJF knows that without an AEW, you just have a monopolized world wrestling entertainment and nobody's going to win. Certainly not all the wrestlers trying to put food on the table and definitely not the fans that are trying to be entertained by professional wrestling so mjf knows that now he's got to stand up against the viewpoint the way that he conducted business anything associated with punk you now have to call that out and mjf did that last night when he said and what we what i damn sure don't take lightly is somebody coming into my company dropping trout and taking a dump in my company that shit ain't happening anymore. And we already heard Jericho say that that shit's not happening anymore. You're starting to see the locker room come together and say, that's never going to happen again. So it's pretty obvious. The locker room has kind of, I'll use the same word I just used, monopolized. They've all gotten together and it's not even about hating CM Punk or disliking him to an extreme measure that you want nothing to do with him, never want to hear his name again. No, it's just he can't be in this company. He's too toxic. We let him in. The, the locker room imploded, and we're just starting to pick up the pieces. It's clear they don't want this guy back, and I bet you if you're Phil Brooks, you don't want to come back because for him, he probably thought that situation was toxic. <laughs> Nobody wins here. I don't think CM Punk Phil Brooks is happy in pro wrestling anymore, um, and that's pretty obvious. I think he tried. He gave it a good attaboy, but I just think that Phil Brooks in, in pro wrestling is just done. It should be done, and we're going to hear nothing but stories about world wrestling entertainment being interested in Punk or Punk being interested in WWE, and it's not going to matter. It's going to be the same vicious cycle where Phil Brooks is not going to be happy. The locker room will be tainted. It will become toxic. Punk will have about three or four buddies in the locker room. The rest of the fucking 112 participants will not like the son of a bitch. And we're going to hear stories that are leaking. It's not a good marriage. Phil Brooks in pro wrestling is not good. The guy is a fucking dick to another level. Does he have justif justified means and, and, and reasonings behind being a dick? Maybe. Possibly. <laughs> but he's a dick. And a lot of the wrestlers don't want to be around him. It's not a good fit. MJF is the latest to come out and just fucking say, not only do I not take that lightly, what you fucking did, but it's also not going to happen anymore. 
And that's what a leader does, right? Jericho had to do that. Jericho never really liked Punk anyway. But Jericho did that publicly in his last like four interviews. He's basically saying, Punk, done, out. <laughs> I'm the leader now. And and it looks like MJF is stepping the fuck up. Now, whether we're being swerved or not, there is still some truth there where MJF... In fact, MJF will tell you it's all fucking truth. He's said this on his social many times, right? Everything I fucking say is true. Not storyline, not character. I'm not just dropping a promo. I'm telling you the fucking truth when I speak. And that's why I love MJF. There's no line between the character and the real fucking dude. And that's the best pro wrestlers growing up. That's what made everybody larger than life. Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Randy Savage, Roddy Piper, Ric Flair. It didn't fucking matter. You were living that shit 24-7. You were not driving with the person you were going to wrestle on Monday. Or back then, it was Saturday or Sunday, Friday. Twice on Sunday, back in the day, they would wrestle. But if you're going to wrestle somebody, you are not driving with them. You are staying at a different hotel. A lot of these fucking Ric Flair tells stories. He would stay in a different city sometimes. That's how real they took it. That's how much they wanted you to know. Today, with social media and, and the curtain is pulled back, the magic tricks have been exposed. And wrestlers just don't take it like that anymore, man. You know, you got Eddie Kingston talking about how he truly does not like Claudio. Cesaro, he real life just does not like him. And then we see a referee post a photo of them at dinner all smiling. Claudio, Eddie Kingston, and the referee. And it's like, bro, you can't do that, man. Like, there has to be some semblance of kayfabe. There has to be some semblance that you give a fuck about your character and you want to invest us into the storyline. Otherwise, the fans can't truly be such. Anyway, let me go to the uh, second. Now, that's just a CM Punk. That's probably what you guys are going to hear a lot about, right? He took the jab at Punk. And, and that's the biggest story out of this. No question. I understand that. But there was another half to this, man. MJF goes on. This is the middle of the ring. This is after Dynamite. This is just for Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's for the house, we call it. And Tony Khan's in the ring. And uh, MJF says this, and I quote, This man right here, Tony Khan, busts his ass week in and week out to give not just you, but to give all the boys in the back an opportunity to show the world how much we love professional wrestling. Without AEW, professional wrestling is a monopoly. And don't get me wrong. This is what MJF says. This is a quote. Don't get me wrong. I love WWE. Trust me. I love WWE. However, hear me out because there were some boos at that point from Bridgeport. Hear me out. Hear me out. Your favorite wrestlers don't get paid properly and don't eat properly unless Tony Khan makes that alternative. And now I'm going to finish... With more honesty. Tony, I'm just going to keep it real with you. I'm carrying this damn place on my back. If I were you, I'd pay up in the bidding war of 2024. Connecticut, you crazy motherfuckers. Better buy this pay-per-view to witness history. Because MJF is taking home the gold. So at the end, he does pump up full gear. So Tony Khan can at least smile for that. Tony Khan is notorious no, no, notorious for plugging his rampages, dynamites, and pay-per-views. Any chance he gets. He takes interviews with people and never answers questions, honestly. Doesn't answer half the fucking questions. He just goes on these interviews to plug his fucking shows. The guy's out there. You say, BC, that's a smart businessman. Nah, man, you're actually pissing people off. Ariel Hawaii said uh, it, it's, it's, it was one of his most frustrating interviews ever. Because the guy did not want to answer anything. There was one point where he told Ariel, he said, can I go to the bathroom? I'll talk some more. Let me just go to the bathroom. He leaves the interview, takes a piss, comes back, and continues not to answer shit. But he plugs Rampage. Fucking Tony Cod. So MJF at least sold this thing afterwards. But damn, he pumped up the chest of Tony Khan. He boldened out those delts of AEW. And by the way, MJF is hitting the fucking iron hard. Dude's got a physique popping out. This dude, I'm telling you, he's taking this shit very serious. This leadership role, whether this is a swerve and he goes full heel, he's taking the leadership role in AEW very serious. Maybe not up to Chris Jericho standard. He's the locker room leader. And then Mox and Danielson right beside him. But he's taking, he's not stay, taking a backseat to anybody. He's telling you he's the fucking leader as well. He's got the company on his fucking back. They've been riding his fucking back since he's got into this company. 
And he's going to look the part as well. MJF is telling you that he's checking off every fucking box going forward if you thought he didn't already check off every fucking box. Anyway, that's the cold open for this video. Again, if you're just jumping in, BC Amplified, your host, we're going to talk some dynamite now. That's your cold open. That's what happened after dynamite. What happened on the actual show? Now, this is going to surprise. This is what I said earlier at the start of this vid. I told you guys that my thoughts on the show and my thoughts on Full Gear might surprise you. If you're faithful to the channel, you know what I mean. So let me start out with Full Gear. This may surprise you. I actually think Full Gear is a stacked fucking card. And Sash, I didn't ask you to cue this up, so um, do not worry. This is actually me just popping this up because I actually want to see uh, this card. And, and just because last night I was thinking about it when it was said anyway, I was like, damn, I, there's like over 10 matches, by the way. I don't like how there's too many matches, but there was a time where we were like full gear, just like the last several AEW pay-per-views. They're just being thrown together last fucking minute. Not necessarily the case. I mean, I know there's like a bunch of fucking matches, but listen to some of these matches, and they actually have some beef. There's some feud. It may not be epic storytelling. It may not have gone off pristinely, and there should have definitely been more added, more added layers to the storyline, to the feud. But there's still matches that you do need to see culminate. You need to see the culminating moment, how this all ends. Like, obviously, Britt Baker and Saraya. Right? I mean, I know that's fairly new within the last month, but that's already became one of the hottest female matches in all of pro wrestling. We're going to get it Saturday. I think that's an ultimate payoff that people would like to see. Steel Cage match, Jungle Boy versus Luchasaurus. I mean, you know the story for Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus has been going on for a couple years now. Tag champs, we know how it all ended up. And the beef has just resonated even more because the the, the fire just kept getting reignited by... Christian, you know, Christian's been the middleman igniting the flames even higher and more brighter and more amplified. And now it's come to a culminating point where you got to settle this in a cage between Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. I, I think that's a good pay-per-view match. AEW TNT Championship match, even though I can't stand how they have booked Wardlow, he does, just does not feel like a champion. He was hardly used on Dynamite for the longest time. I know, TNT champ, Rampage, TBS is dynamite now, doesn't matter. I mean, Wardlow is his booking, and you could say that about a lot of people in AEW, very questionable, and he should be gaining all the momentum in the world because he had all the momentum in the world. Why cut his legs out from underneath him? Why swipe the rug out from underneath him? It's almost like Tony Khan sabotaged him internally, and that's what happened. Even though it wasn't consciously, maybe it was subconsciously because Tony Khan's always got a million things running through his dome piece. He needs to slow it down. The hamster needs to slow down spinning on the wheel upstairs. But in all seriousness, if you look at this title match, and I hate schmazes, anything more than one-on-one -on -one or a traditional two-on-two -two tag, I call that a schmaz. But this is a badass triple threat. Wardlow versus Powerhouse Hobbs versus Samoa Joe. Think about those three dudes. Put them in the ring. Strap up a fucking title high above, and there you go. I mean, it's not a ladder match, so it's not going to be high above, but it's going to be hanging over their dome piece subconsciously. While they're fighting, they know there's a big prize at the end of the line, at the end of the tunnel. So Wardlow, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Samoa Joe. I mean, that's, just, that's a, that's a pay-per-view triple threat. Uh, trios tag match, I'm not at all interested in because I don't like schmazes. Like I said, if it's not one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two, -two, then it's a schmaz. A trios division, I'm not high on. I don't like trios. It's a circus. It's just six dudes. It's never traditional either. It's just a tornado. All six dudes are doing crazy flips and flying all over the place. Nobody's selling properly. You guys know how I feel about that. This is going to be, um, trios tag title holders, death triangle taking on the former title holders, the elite. But this is interesting because it's the elite's return to AEW since the brawl post All Out. So this is their return to AEW. We have not seen them since. The fuck did I just put... just snap that fucking? Pa I'm getting amplified talking about the card, bro. Fucking! <laughs> I just snapped half the fucking pen. You see that? Damn! Some the 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 the, the wrestling gods do not like the elite. <laughs> CM Punk dropping into his fucking Bray Wyatt powers, man. Pen jumps up. Coffee's gonna fucking pop all over the place. 
Um, the elite's coming back, whether the wrestling gods like it or not. The elite is coming back and probably going to win these titles. But that's that's kind of interesting, even though the, the match doesn't interest BC. For a lot of you guys, you're, you're going to love the competition. I use that lightly. I mean, it's... It's not like just, it's not a real sport. <laughs> I don't know how much competition, but you're going to be entertained by all the action, I'm sure. But the elite coming back is kind of fucking big, man. That's, that's a big story and people are going to see the condition they're in in the match that they're going to have. RH World Championship match, Fatal 4-Way, Chris Jericho, Brian Daniels, and Sammy Guevara, Claudio. Again, it's a schmaz match, but think about these four individuals. I mean, you saw what they did in a tag team match last night, which was pretty damn fun. Now you just have all of them taking on one another. I think you're going to see an amplified version of what we saw last night. Pretty interesting. Tony Storm versus Jamie Hayter has been be being built up decently. Good? No. But bad? Absolutely not. So it's. I just wish it was an interim. I, I wish that this was handled correctly from the jump and that Thunder Rosa just vacated the fucking title, and that's Tony Khan's problem. Tony let her walk away with the fucking actual title, and with a back injury that we don't even know what the real problem is, we knew this was going to take a long time, and sure enough, she's not coming back till it looks like 2023 at some point. And, and you just let her walk away with a fucking title for like half a year when it's all said and done. It's bullshit. And Tony Storm was pissed off, and publicly she said she's pissed off, and she just wants Thunder to come back so she can just do the fucking job that was supposed to be done, and she can be the actual title holder. I feel bad for Tony Storm, I really do. But this is for an interim championship, and I feel that that dilutes the match just a little bit. Just a little bit! AEW Tag Team Championship match. The Acclaimed versus Swerve in Our Glory. I'm not excited for that one, obviously. Acclaimed FTR is the money match. That would have sold the tag division through the roof. And I just feel that FTR is just being diminished so badly that when we finally get FTR in Acclaimed, I just, I, I hope most people give a fuck. FTR was riding with the most momentum in the world. In the fucking world. Um, and there was a time where it should have been them and the Young Bucks on a high prestigious platform. And it was just derailed. And Tony Khan stopped booking FTR in tag matches. FTR has only been in about three tag matches in the last several months. They have only have three tag wins in seven months. Seven months, three tag, actual two-on-two. Two. Otherwise, they're being booked in, in six-man tags, one-on-ones, or eight-man tags. Uh, I don't know what Tony Khan did to, to FTR. And, and you say, well, it can't be FTR and Acclaimed, BC, because a Acclaimed have all the momentum in the world as well right now, so neither team could lose. And this will eventually end up to the swerve in our glory breakup and all that. Uh, then then go a different route for it. Give FTR something of relevance. FTR has nothing on the card. FTR is just an afterthought. FTR, the hottest tag team in the world, just six months ago, is an afterthought now. And we're, it looks like we're just riding with the acclaimed. I just hope that when we get to the FTR big stage matches, if we ever get there again with Tony, I hope most people give a fuck. Because, wow, like Wardlow, did that just implode? And they, they should have exploded. They should have just been the, on top of the wrestling world. And somehow, people like Wardlow, people like FTR, people like Ricky Starks, there's a lot of people, Orange Cassidy, Darby Allen, that you thought were going to ride off into the sunset with all the momentum in the world. Actually, no, riding off into the sunset would mean you're fucking taking off. You'd be riding into every town with all the momentum in the world. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, the, the booking decisions of Tony Khan are so questionable, but acclaim swerve in our glory. Mm, take it or leave it, I can leave that one. AEW World Championship Eliminator Tournament Finals, Ethan Page versus Brian Cage. They got history, obviously. And Ricky Starks or Lance Archer. Again, not too high on that one. Uh, I'm just not big on tournaments. But then you get to the championship match, Moxley versus MJF. I mean, that's just sheer, pure money. That's a main event at a pay-per-view. The way they've been hyping this bitch, fuck yeah, sign me up for that twice. So, I mean, there's a lot of good matches, some that I absolutely could do without, some that should not be on the pay-per-view, possibly. You also got Jade Cargill versus Nyla Rose. They tried. They tried. Is it going to be anything irrelevant? Probably not. It'll just be another W for Jade, another L for Nyla. But you're trying to keep the title in Jade Cargill prevalent, so I just talked about how Tony Khan doesn't do that for a lot of people. I can't... I can't speak out of both ends here, brah. I gotta, 
I got to call it down the middle. If I'm going to claim that Tony doesn't do it for certain, I got to give him props for at least giving Jade Cargill a pay-per-view match. And they did try to make this something, but a lot of it was on Rampage. So they tried, but maybe not hard enough to make people care about Jade versus Nyla. Anyway, that's going to be my thoughts on Full Gear going forward. You're probably not going to hear me talk about it in depth until after the show when we, we review it in some form or facet. But that's my thoughts on Full Gear. I actually don't mind this pay-per-view. Too many matches. Yes, a couple should have been off. And a couple just don't interest me. But at least five to six matches I'm down with. And again, those are Soraya and Britt Baker, Jungle Boy Luchasaurus. The triple threat match somehow does intrigue me. And the, the obviously that, that main event with Mox and Jericho and the Fatal 4-Way is intriguing just because I know they're going to put on a show. So uh, that's why I say my thoughts on Full Gear might be a little stunning. A, I don't mind the card as a whole. B, there's a couple of schmazes I'm actually interested in. That doesn't always happen. Now on the flip side, so I don't mind Full Gear. I think Tony Khan took nothing and turned it into something rather quickly. And then there was last night to build up to full gear, right? Then there was last night where it's the go-home show and you want to get everybody fully excited. Did he do that? Did Tony make you so damn excited that you can't wait till Saturday night? Saturday, Mox, not Sunday. If you saw the show last night, you know what BC's talking about. The answer is no. The answer is no. Tony Khan put together a pretty lackluster show last night. And BC watched the entire two hours. And when you have a go-home show to full gear that people are still deciding should they get it or not, you have War Games Survivor Series, which Paul Triple H Levesque has built up so fucking poorly. I I can't even fucking, I, I won't even go over it in detail, but... They're still trying to put the card together. Pat McAfee this past week asked Michael Cole on his show, what do you got planned for Survivor Series, meaning the company? And Michael Cole goes, well, we, we're still trying to figure it out, but we're going to deliver something special. Well, Michael, it's next weekend. <laughs> it's right after Thanksgiving, bro. Saturday, 26th. They're still trying to, they don't have a men's war games match yet. It's going to be Bloodline, Brawling Brutes, Drew, and two other people are going to be announced Friday, one week before the pay-per-view, the premium live event. The women has just been announced this past Monday because people just started getting thrown in. Mia Yim jumped into the match, Rhea Ripley, and now all of a sudden we have a women's match that we're supposed to care about. No, Paul Levesque didn't have the the, the time, energy, or creativity to, to tell us why we should give a fuck about all the participants in the match against one another. No, he's just going to sell us on the War Games concept, and we're all going to eat it up. Oh, War Games! You still, I, I don't know why I need to see all these people brawling. i just seen everybody brawl the last four, five, six months, all of these people in the match. Now you're just going to put a cage around them, and i got to watch it again? As far as the undercard... Gunther's championship is being decided by a a fucking tournament. Another tournament. How many tournaments do do we see in pro wrestling? It's the easiest, most laziest way to book somebody. You just make a fucking tournament and then you can fill up a bunch of your shows and then it culminates at a pay-per-view where you don't have to you don't have to think or get creative or spend time creating an actual challenger for your champion. No, that takes too much time. So they get lazy and they just do a stupid bullshit tournament. And that decides the champion's contender. Or they just have a number one contender's match and the the challenger beats the champion and then we just have to see the same match at a pay-per-view. But it's rinse and repeat. It's all cut and paste. You know, there's that false report four months ago about uh, Vince McMahon was going to bury Gunther. Now, that's been already proven false. If you have common sense and logic, you know that's a false story because it doesn't make sense. Vince was pushing Gunther through the roof. Road Dog says that Vince didn't even know who Gunther was when he first got there. Yeah, how funny Vince turned into a Gunther fan, a Walter fan, right? Whether you like the name or not, I totally understand. But Vince thought it was going to be a more marketable name and he was going to push him. And that's what he did. Winning streak, put the IC championship on him. And then this false story by a numbnuts who makes up fucking false wrestling stories. Uh, Vince was going to bury Gunther 
And then we find out how false it truly was. Common sense and logic told you it was false, but then Imperium stood up and said, actually, that's bullshit. Vince was high on us. We had nothing but the most best of talks. Nobody was burying anybody. And then, because Triple H had a bad week this week, they had to regurgitate the story, all the Triple H fucking bootlickers. They had to regurgitate a Vince McMahon story from four months ago because they wanted the focus off of Triple H and they wanted to deflect it to Vince McMahon. So we repeated a story from four months ago that was already debunked. Fucking astronomically hilarious, if not downright sad. (laughs) But if you tell me that Gunther's being booked any better under Paul Levesque, I'm going to laugh in your fucking face. (laughs) We're fucking building up Gunther matches at Survivor Series by tournaments. Wow. Thank goodness Vince is gone for Gunther. I tell you, man, you can't make this shit up, bro. And then for the women, or no, yeah, it is the women, right? Ronda Rousey's number one contender stemmed from a six-pack challenge. That's how we came up with Ronda's number one. And then Shotzi wins it, and then afterwards backstage tells Shayna, Ronda's never been in the ring with somebody like me. Did Shotzi forget that not only has Ronda been in the ring with somebody like you, she's actually been in the ring with you. She made you tap out in just minutes. So I understand you're trying to sell the match like we've never seen it, but it was just five months ago that we saw Shotzi versus Ronda. Anyway, my point is, Survivor Series is weak as fuck. At least Full Gear has a a fucking pulse. Full Gear has a lifeline. There's matches on Full Gear you kind of need to see culminate. But this show, this show did not get you any more excited to see it. And that's the problem with this go-home show. When you have matches like Anthony Bowens versus Swerve Strickland, I know how over the acclaimed is, guys. And I'm not saying you're not going to see action. But this is a go-home show. You do want to attract casuals, especially for this show, because you want to get the most pay-per-view buys, guys. When you're talking pay-per-views, you don't don't want the niche audience. You want the casuals to stop by and go, hey, actually, Saturday night, my my plans uh, changed. They they got canceled. And it's going to be cold Saturday anyway. You know what? Actually, I'm going to get this event. There's people that do that, guys. Casuals will stop by and go, you know what? That one is that, Saturday night? Don't listen to Mox. He'll tell you it's Sunday. (laughs) And Anthony Bowens versus Swerve Strickland is is not going to do it, guys. Ethan Page versus Bandito is not going to do it. Tony Storm versus Anna Jay is not going to do it. And these are all matches that were on last night. Death Triangle taking on Dante and Darius Martin with A.R. Fox. A lot of you guys are going, I'm sorry, who, who, and who? Like it's the fucking Grinch. And welcome to Whoville. Who, who, who? New Day, put down the pancakes. I don't know, bro. That's what a lot of people are saying. I don't know these people. This is is what you got last night. Dante and Darius and AR Fox in action. Bowens versus Strickland. Anna J and Tony. Storm. And Bandito and Ethan Page. You know, you started off hot with Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara versus Danielson and Claudio. And then you ended with a, a fire promo between Mox and... And MJF and everything in between. You did not sell the pay-per-view properly. You didn't. Soraya and Britt Baker. Baker had a really good backstage promo interview segment. Without Tony Schiavone, nobody. Not even Renee Paquette. Just looking at the camera. And she cut a good promo. But that was it. This is one of your marquee matches. Soraya's return. Paige's return to wrestling as her, herself, Soraya. This is her return, you know. And this is a big match that people are looking forward to. And that's all you had for them on Dynamite. Paige is in a fucking 20-second promo. Like, I'm done talking. I just want to go to full gear. And she walks off. That's not enough. You should have had something much more creative for that, man. Tony Storm versus Jamie Hayter. You're not going to believe what they did with Tony Storm and Jamie Hayter last night. You're not going to believe how ridiculous their segment was. I'll get to it. But let me start off from the jump. Hour number one and the show kicks off with Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara versus Danielson and Claudio. This was a 19-minute match. Good. Good match. But more importantly, a fun match, right? You can see a billion good matches these days. Almost any match that has a couple of good sequences and some flives and some whoa dives, everyone's going to chant, this is awesome, and and it's going to be a good match. No, this was a fun match, and that's not that common these days. 
My one negative critique, I wish it were more of a traditional tag match and less of a tornado tag match. But that's just AEW, guys. When you get an AEW multi-man match, starting with tag into trios into eight-mans, ten-mans, you're just going to get tornado rules. It's not specified that that's the case. It's just going to be anarchy, chaos, a circus. Everybody's getting their moves in. And that's why I don't like... Um, even tag matches in AEW these days, it's just tornado rules. I wish people would just stay in their corner, grab the little white rope and wait for your tag. Once in a while, you have all four dudes, no doubt, right? Create those action packed moments in the match, but then go back to traditional so we can see an actual tag team match. But I guess BC's just too old school. Fans attention spans are so short these days that you need the non-stop action. It's TNA wrestling, basically. Total non-stop action. And every tag match is Tornado. I wish it was more traditional because I think these four dudes could put on a, a banger of a traditional tag match. The finish was great. Claudio has Jericho in a full swing. And, and this dude is... He, Claudio spun Jericho like 20 fucking times, guys. <laughs> it was crazy. But even better... The best part was that the entire time Jericho was being spun, he was holding his baseball bat the entire time, guys. So after 20 swings, Jericho tries to swap the bat and he's so dizzy that he's just like swinging it like a fucking a six-year-old would toss around a fucking wiffle bat. <laughs> just all over the place. Like a fucking kid trying to hit a pinata blindfolded. It was funny. So Claudio just takes the bat and he just puts it on his shoulder, gets Jericho into a sharpshooter, and Jericho taps out from the sharpshooter. Um, Danielson and Claudio scored the W. So it was interesting to see Jericho just take the tap out up front ahead of full gear. That tells you, though, that Jericho is walking out with the championship, it looks like. And this is a way to soften all that up. Oh, Jericho's winning all the time. You know, there's going to be those fans that say that. But he's going to redirect you to Wednesday night when he took the fucking tag. He tapped the fuck out. After he got swung 20 fucking times, subsequently, Claudio taps him out. So, uh, good tag match, though. But fun. More importantly, fun. And then we just went into a little bit of, uh, you know, we, we just got a little bit lackadaisical on the show, man. Anthony Bowens versus Swerve Strickland. Before the match, we see the world premiere music video by the acclaimed which was a diss track to swerve in our glory, basically, and a cameo from Captain Insano. If you guys ever saw the water boy, <laughs> well, it's Captain Insano. The fucking big show with a cameo in this fucking, uh, at the beginning of this world premiere. Max Caster cut his traditional pre-match rap and cut a line about being burned worse than Jay Leno. Now, guys, BC had no idea what happened to Jay Leno. I really didn't. So I heard that line and I had to do some research and uh, I found out about Jay, man. Oh, much respect and love over to Jay Leno, man. He was working on his car and he was underneath it and it, there's just a, a gas fire somehow. Gasoline and, and fire and he got third, second to third degree burns, face, hands, chest, everything, man. Um, damn, dude. It was just, it did not sound great. Uh, he already had a couple of... Uh, surgery, yeah, it's just, it's it's not good, man. So to Jay Leno, man, much love and respect. And uh, so I guess who would have thought that Max Caster would be BC's news source these days? <laughs> but I had to do some research. So then it made the line even more hard. I was like, ah, oh, did we have to go there, Caster? And I think one of his lines was, yeah, we're not afraid to go there, was in his rap. But uh, yeah, that was a, <laughs> that was a hard one, man. Poor Jay. So then afterwards, during this match between Bowens and Strickland, Tony Schiavone actually said, I worked with Jay Leno back in the WCW days, basically, and he's such a good person, and we wish him nothing but the best of speedy recovery. They wanted everyone to know that that was just a, a comedic line in the rap. Everybody relax. So Tony Khan, uh, Tony Khan, Tony Schiavone kind of made everybody relax, because a lot of people are like, dude, that's not funny to joke about. This guy just got fucking burned. It could have been even worse. Anyway, uh, this is back to the match. It was an eight-minute match. Swerve pins Bowens. Pretty cut and dry. Swerve gets a W here, but will obviously lose Saturday night in the tag match. So it's pretty cut and dry what's going on here. No harm, no foul. I just don't know what this does for BC for the tag match. It doesn't do much. If anything, it just pumps up the fucking stock 
and how over the acclaimed is right now. Speaking of Tony Schiavone, he's up next with an interview middle of the ring with Samoa Joe. Powerhouse Hobbs intervenes. Hobbs says, and this is while he's in the aisle way, Hobbs says, and I quote, you're a little late to the party, Joe. In case you haven't noticed, I'm the one who's been kicking Wardlow's ass for weeks now. And now maybe I should just come down there and kick your ass. And he does such. But Joe responds before he comes to the ring. Joe says, and I quote, if you book your knuckles like you book your gums, let's go. Think about that line. I love that line. If you book your knuckles like you book your gums, let's go. But before Hobbs and him can really get into it, Wardlow enters the fray. Joe turns around and Wardlow levels him with a Wardlow spear. Wardlow, Hobbs, Joe, everybody starts brawling. There's about a hundred motherfuckers trying to break them up. Now, somehow this all ends with everybody outside and they're doing that thing where everybody hugs each other and waits for somebody to do their spot over the ropes. In this case, it was Wardlow. Dive bombs to the backside of the fucking ropes. Catapults himself over the... Now, he's a big boy, so this was a nice fucking flippity dive, you know? (laughs) But he flies like a 747 over the top rope, and he lands on all fucking 186 individuals down below. Um, In the aisle way. So, pretty cool spot. I'm not a big flips and dives type of of a guy. I just don't think that's... That's not pro. I like larger than life characters and storylines that captivate over in ring action and sequences. I think if you put it all together, then we have the best product possible. I think that wrestling is kind of divided right now and we don't have wrestlers that have the full package, the total package, not Lex Luger, (laughs) although he was pretty damn good. But we don't have wrestlers that, you know, you have wrestlers that can flip and dive and do all these cool moves, but they just suck on the mic and they don't captivate you. You have big dudes that should be captivating, maybe decent on the mic, but they just suck in the ring. So you just don't have everybody with the full package these days, you know, and it's uh, there's only a few individuals. But uh, it was a pretty, pretty cool fucking move over that top rope, man. For a guy of his size, for Wardlow, or yeah, Wardlow to do that shit. And that's how that segment ended. Again, I'm actually intrigued a little bit with this triple threat. I don't know if this segment did its best to get me any more excited. And that's really what the go-home show should be. But it didn't do that. For BC, if it did for you, cool, man. That's all that matters. Our number one ends uh, with a great backstage promo by Britt Baker. DMD. And I'm not surprised. Britt Baker takes a lot of dislike and hate in the community. And it's just, it's unwarranted. There's a lot of bullshit backstage stories by people that should not be spreading that shit. But it is what it is. You know, they only take one side and and Britt Baker took uh, the blunt of a lot of shit. But Britt Baker consistently drops fucking W's for that company. And I'm not talking about in the ring taking W's. She just drops W's. Like Britt Baker is very, very good for that company. It's a marriage made in fucking heaven. And and I'm not just saying she's one of the in-ring skilled best wrestlers in the world. I'm saying she checks off just about every box, if not all, nearly. And Britt Baker is in there, and, and she dropped a great line. She says, and I quote, I didn't wrestle in MSG. This is basically, she's saying this all to Paige, Soraya. I didn't wrestle in M- MSG, but you know where I did wrestle? Daly's place. When no one was there, but we were there for them. During the darkest of times, don't you dare belittle me or diminish my accomplishments in my career. I am the heart and soul of AEW. I love those lines. She's so right, man. She is the heart and soul of AEW. Whether you love her or not, I hear you. Whether you think there's better or not, uh, maybe I hear you. She's the heart and soul of that division, man. She stood the fuck up. And stepped the fuck up. And she paid her dues. You got to remember, as she reminds everybody constantly, when she got the AEW, she did the lap for everybody. She took the yell to everybody, man. She was paying her dues. She just didn't get to the roster and she was already automatically anointed the top spot like a lot of people claim. Even Soraya in her promo last week. I got to give a a salute to Britt Baker. I know that that may be... uh, That may not be the most popular of things to hear from a lot of you guys. But I think Britt Baker is, she gets a bad rap, man. And a lot of it is just unwarranted. 
So that's how our number one ended. And I just and then later on, uh, Soraya just cut a twenty second promo with Renee Paquette, and she just says, "I don't. I'm just done talking. Uh, I just I'm going to full gear and just getting it done." And she walks off. Eh, I know that sounds good, right? Oh, she's done. Oh, I can't wait to see. She just wants to get it on. It's just you should have hyped this up way better. I mean, this is something that really has people talking, Soraya and Britt Baker. And I just feel like combined, you had a two minute interview segment. If you combined both separate ones, you should have had more for this match. Hour number two starts with the trio's titles, Death Triangle versus Dante Martin, Darius Martin, and A.R. Fox. I, I don't know. Pack, and these are good wrestlers, by the way, obviously. They fly and they dive and they do all that. <laughs> Braun Strowman's arch nemesis. Um, Pack defeats Fox via pin following a black arrow. I don't cover these matches. It's just I don't cover trios matches. They're, they're six man tags. And there's Schmaz matches to BC. It's too much of a circus. Too many people. It's, if it was traditional and there was four people on the outside at all times and I could actually cover the action and really understand the ring psychology they're trying to present to us and there was a more more selling and people didn't have to constantly get up to do their spots and then sell for other people's spots then i would review these matches much better and more often but there's nothing to cover here it's usually a circus with a lot of action and um, you had the uh, this is awesome chant while people were sitting down go back to this match listen to the this is awesome and watch everybody they're sitting down like it's a golf clap this is what this is awesome means. You remember when this is awesome used to mean something Undertaker, Shawn Michaels type matches when everybody be on their feet, jaw drop and just go into this is awesome. And they were wild, man. Now we get this is awesome. They're checking their phones, eating their fucking hot dog. This is awesome. Everyone's sitting down just screaming. This is awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's awesome. You, you, or is it just good? Do you like the sequences? Every match is awesome to wrestling fans these days. <laughs> if you do some cool moves, it's awesome. Who needs psychology and selling anymore? Wrestling in 2022. Um, and that's not a diss to anybody. Obviously, we have utmost respect for Pac in, in, in the others, but come on, man. Awesome? And you look at everybody, it doesn't feel awesome. You're sitting the fuck down checking your phone while you spit out, this is awesome. Anyway, I don't cover this shit. So that's what you get in the review. Pack defeats Fox via Black Arrow pinfall. Post match, the elite finally reveal themselves to be the challengers for the trio's titles at full gear. Uh, this is up on the their little Tron, their video, their screen, um, and it's revealed to be the elite. Now that shows up on the graphic, and Pack's response in the ring was great. Pack says, and I quote: "Finally, some transparency." He says, Elite, you may think you're coming for us, but we've been waiting for you. That's badass. I love that line. Gotta believe those titles are coming back home to the EVPs, guys. You gotta believe that. I don't think they're gonna come back and just um, just drop this match. I don't like to see Kenny Omega with the Bucks. I think Kenny Omega has so much more to do in his prime individually, but I think this EVP thing weighs them down more than it helps them. I think it weighed the company down, and, and it hurt the company. Just having your peers be EVPs. And I also think it hurt Young Bucks and Omega. Guys, I'm going to say this. I will shout this out to the mountaintop until I see it corrected. Since the very first AEW show till now, I don't think that we've seen the best version or best booking of the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. It's been the opposite. In fact, from when the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega were so popular in pro wrestling, it had nothing to do with WWE. It was New Japan. They were in a different country. And they were the talk of the wrestling world. That's how AEW kind of helped, was formed. You had in Cody, you had the money backed by Tony Khan, AEW was formed. But it was on the backs of what was happening with people like Young Bucks and Omega. Since the start of AEW, it's been absolutely fucking bonkers bad. <laughs> Just ballistically bad booking. Hangman Page and Omega in a tag team for like a fucking year. And the payoff was never even good. I, I, I kept being told, basically, the payoff, man... It's long-term storytelling. He's an EVP, just doesn't want to just book himself to the top yet. I'm like, bro, this has nothing to do with be booking yourself to the top or being an EVP. This is the fact that Kenny Omega is one of the top wrestlers in the world with all the momentum in the world. Don't put him in a fucking tag team, which a lot of the wrestling world doesn't know in Hangman Page. Sure enough, the payoff was never good. The payoff fucking sucked, actually. To this day, 
uh, that weighed Omega down, and he never got corrected. Remember there was a time where Omega had a bunch of titles around him? And he just still was just not the Omega that he once was. And, and then Young Bucks have just botched themselves into, into oblivion. I just feel like this EVP thing has weighed them down, and they felt that they had the book differently because they were EVPs. And I think that affected Cody as well. And Cody did that stupid stipulation where I can never again go for the world title if I lose. And he knew he had to lose because he didn't want to be booked like the, the, the EVP that's booking himself to the moon because people are already starting to boo him for that. I don't like that shit at all. But it looks like they're going to come back and, and just be in a fucking trios division. Ethan Page versus Bandito. Page defeats Bandito via pinfall following Ego's Edge finisher. Basically like the razor's edge, but he just flies you into a powerbomb. <laughs> Only he doesn't go with you. That's the ego's edge. Page moves on in the Eliminator Tournament. Just like I don't like Schmaz matches, I can't stand tournaments. We're treating this like it's a real fucking competition over storyline, right? Oh, this is a, a tournament that we got to see who the best is. This is how we're going to determine a challenger for a title. It's lazy. It's fucking lazy. In 10 minutes, you can draw out a whole tournament that lasts a whole month. And it fills up TV shows. It fills up your fucking challenger for the champion at a pay-per-view. It's lazy booking. AEW does tournaments, it seems, every fucking month. Tony Storm defeats Anna J. A go-home show to full gear. And Tony Storm is in there with Anna J. Storm defeats Anna J via tap out. Post match, Jamie Hader power walks to the ring. Now this is the match for full gear for the interim title because Tony botched and didn't take the title from Thunder Rosa. And Thunder Rosa is gone till who the fuck knows when? Twenty forty seven at this point. Tony Storm will retire being an interim fucking title holder. But Storm defeats Jay, and then afterwards, Jamie Hader comes out. Okay, this is the match for full gear. I hope they have something big planned here with this face-to-face. -face. They go face-to-face, -face, Hader and Storm. And Hader just pushes Storm's boobs. Just touches her, just grabs her, just pushes her boobs. And Tony Storm goes back a step or two, and then Hader goes, hmm, and walks away. Hader pushes the boobs of Storm back, and then Hader just walks away. Hater power walk to the ring just to push her boobs and walk away. And Storm is just like, mm, you touch my boobs. Legit, just, just walk like. What the fuck just went down? Uh, BC was like, wait, what? That's. Sash, can you look at this, please, and tell me what I'm missing? You know, it was one of those moments where. I was about to call up my assistant at fucking uh, 9.30. <laughs> Could you put on dynamite? They're going to show a replay. Tell me if I'm missing something. I don't know what the fuck that was supposed to. That was a Tony Khan botch. I mean, this is your fucking title match, bro. Your farce of a fucking title match anyway, but big match at full gear anyway. Should have been. And they just look at each other, boob push, walk away. Whoa, can't wait to see this match. Tommy, did you see Hater and Storm? This has got 10 times more exciting. Come on, man. Like, you got to do better. You're a pro wrestling show on national television. You have fun with the creativity. Have fun with this shit, you know? You get to create the story that the world is watching. And that's the best that they came up with. We end the night in the main event spot, not with a match, but with Mox hitting the ring with William Regal. Mox cuts yet another fire promo. Mox has just been on cloud fucking night. The, the one botch I seen this guy cut in, in months was actually last night at the end when he had to ask MJF when the pay-per-view was. <laughs> Other than that, the dude's been fucking just pristine on that mic. He really has been, even though I say MJF, I back up MJF's claims he has been carrying the company on his back, but... So has Mox. Mox has stepped the fuck up when Punk went into business for himself. Stokely's crew hits the ring and attacks Mox. MJF then hits the ring. Diesel AF, by the way. He hits the ring and he, he gets the save from Mox. And, and then MJF grabs the mic and proceeds to cut a promo. A straight fire yet again promo as if he can cut anything but fire on Mox. And MJF... Um, just leaves a scathing promo onto Mox. And at the end, he just says, because I'm MJF and I'm better than you. And Mox grabs the mic from him. And Mox starts to fucking 
go back with him a little bit why MJF listens face to face. MJF is not backing down. And then I love, yeah, at the end, like I like I previously stated, but Mox is like, in Sunday night, I'm going to teach you. And then he's like, Saturday. What's Sunday? When's the pay-per-view? Saturday? Sunday? Saturday. <laughs> and, and William Regal's yelling, Saturday! Saturday! MJF is like, Saturday. Poor Mox doesn't know what fucking day. Mox just wants to show up and fight, wrestle, get in there, do what he does. Mox just wants to fucking wrestle, man. I love the story that Renee Paquette says. They, they were going to a wedding. I think it was Alexa Bliss's wedding, no? Maybe it was Alexa's wedding, but they were going to a wedding. And Renee's there, and she's like, Mox, where are you? Mox is running late because he was coming back from a show or something, and his, his, his plane ride the next morning was all, I don't know. But he takes a late cab. He's in a fucking like leather jacket. He's got his wrestling boots on. He's in a late cab. He's like, I'm on my way. He shows up in his wrestling boots to a wedding. I mean, this is real life mocks. It's not that different than what you see. I love that shit, man. I love when people are a lot of themselves in real life. It's just the volumes turned up to 10 when you see them in their wrestling characters. I love that shit. Um, so right now, man, uh, that, that stare down ends the show. And these two are just on another level right now. MJF and Mox are fucking on another level right now. And nobody can touch them in AEW. In the wrestling world, maybe Bray Wyatt would be the only one. Roman's been on another level, but it's kind of different. I mean, Mox and MJF have just put that company on their fucking back, dude. And I, I mean, when you think of that, and now they're going at it for the world title Saturday night. Saturday night. And then you think, like, on top of that, we're going to find out. Is MJF truly going to be the next face of AEW? Like, one of those top fucking faces? Or is he? Is this all a swerve? And he's going to become an even bigger heel than before. Maybe William Regal is in on it. Maybe Stokely Hathaway was in on it the whole time as well. And this was all just to get that fucking title. He doesn't care about winning it the right way. He doesn't care about doing things honorably. He's going to do it by any means necessary at any and all costs. And that's how we ended the show. So uh, lackluster for the build to full gear. I don't mind full gear at all. The card. Few things obviously I changed. Maybe get rid of too many matches. I get it. But a lot of those matches, yeah, I would like to see the culminating moments of it. See how it all unfolds. But the show didn't get anybody any more excited. It was actually lackadaisical. It was actually not that good of a show. If you're saying this is a good show, I'll give it to you, man. That's in the eye of the beholder. But it wasn't that good if you're going to say it was good. And the go-home showed a full gear, man. This should have been a show that we're talking about for many reasons. Instead, the top story is about what happened after the show and MJF just fucking bringing Bridgeport, Connecticut, the house, a fucking promo for the ages. Talking about how he loves WWE, but it's Tony Khan who's giving that alternative and making it better for all of us. Talking to CM Punk directly without mentioning the dude's name, saying I'm done having people come in here and take a shit in this company. That shit ain't happening anymore. <sighs> a lot is going to be decided at full gear. So whether you guys are going to order or not, watch it or not, BC will talk about it. I don't know how in-depth the review is going to be, but I will talk absolutely about full gear this weekend, man. Because that Saturday night show, a lot is going to be decided. And a lot is going to be known for the future, heading into 2023 and beyond. Uh, that was longer than I anticipated. I think that was like an hour-ish, give or take a few minutes. So BC is going to let you go, guys go about your Thursday. There's a chance that there's another video out later today. So obviously, stay subbed and notified. Or don't. I don't give a fuck. If you're part of the AMP unit, great. If you're not, hit the fucking bricks. But either way... There's possibly going to be another video later, maybe even live. I'm not sure. There's a couple hours I may have later. It's cold as fuck these days, too, bruh. So BC likes to be in a little bit more to do business and do my other business adventures. Uh, almost said adventures. Yeah, they're adventures, all right. Um, so there's a chance there'll be another video as well. Again, if not, either way. Much power to my Green Bay Packers for later tonight. Thursday night football, hopefully, they get the job done against Tennessee Titans. BC Amplified, for now, top guy, and I am fucking out. BC saying, check you. There's only one thing left to say for now. Sasha, you know what you gotta do. You gotta hit my motherfucking music. Check you, peace. Salud.